welcome for this Rising Tide Foundation some or lecture delivered by my good friend Bruce de Torres. And it is something which I think is very timely, very important at this moment in history. It was just in December of this year that another batch of uh, records that had formerly been classified for a very long time relating to the JFK murder were released. I've been looking at some of the coverage of people who have been combing through some of that content and not surprisingly, there's not much there in terms of so far or from what I see and I could be wrong, but from what I've what I've uh, seen so far it doesn't seem like they've released anything that is all that interesting so far and again Bruce correct me if I'm wrong. What I have gotten from the spin that is uh, the mainstream media is so good at has been to say that the one really interesting thing is the Russian connection that there are new points of evidence that had been suppressed by the CIA that were protecting the Russians because Lee Harvey Oswald was apparently in in Mexico City speaking to the Russian embassy and uh, and of course this fits in because you're like wondering well why is it how is it that the current regime running the United States would would release more evidence uh pertaining to the the JFK assassination which I think everybody here because you you are here in this digital room you've probably made your own discoveries that there has been a coup d'etat that occurred over 50 years ago, um, which involved the U.S. as a whole um, going through one of the most destructive transformations and takeovers of a foreign entity, um, which occurred over the dead body first of JFK and then his brother. So like, how would the current, um, why would the current regime make more of this data public? Well, of course, again, they're spinning it because the object the objective right now is to create a new uh, iron curtain, a new, well, even more than an iron curtain. Basically, they're trying to revive the Cold War as a whole and maybe even make it a hot war, uh, which didn't happen for the first round. So this is something which would not happen if people thought a little bit more like JFK, like Franklin Roosevelt, like Lincoln, like the American founding fathers who gave so much and sacrificed so much to create a new type of world, a new type of culture and political economy that had never been permitted to blossom in human history up until 1776. If people had were, were more in tune with their deeper traditions, we would definitely not be so ill-equipped mentally and spiritually and morally to allow for these current lies and fabrications to take hold of the zeitgeist. So as the best inoculation to stupidity and the effects of stupidity, which can result in massive wars, is truth, knowledge, and wisdom. And for that, Bruce has written um, a very interesting book. Uh, I had a look through it. I read it. Uh, God's School, 9-11, and JFK, The Lies That Are Killing Us and the Truth That Sets Us Free. Um, he wrote this about a year and a half, year and a bit more ago. Um, dealing with a, I found a very heartfelt, honest assessment of JFK, what was lost when he was murdered and what were the principles that animated his identity, his thinking, his passion, such that we can all tap into a little bit of that spark within us today, which is so desperately needed, but also within the broader context of universal history, which is, a, I think, a very, very enriching and important exercise for most people to take on, even though our school system has really crippled that uh, approach to history as a universal, continuous moral process that is supposed to be something that is more geared towards understanding what future we want to create and not so much about just memorizing what events happened in the past to, to pass a test. So with that, Bruce, thank you so much for doing this. And um, after your, your main remarks and presentation is over, as usual, uh, I'll call upon people to pose questions or thoughts uh, in the Q&A session. So it's all yours. Excellent. I'll share the PowerPoint that I have prepared. And thank you for this invitation, Matthew. JFK, what he did, how, and why we must. I am Bruce DeTaurus, many years as an actor, then decided to write a book about energy and consciousness and the nature of existence. And then 9-11 happened. And I couldn't stop researching all those kind of truths into JFK. And then I decided I'll wrap all the horrors with my thinking about what a completely spiritual, 
magical, incredible realm this is, and therein lies our hope. You can read all about it at brewstatoris.com. Get a copy at trynday.com. I do marketing for Chris Milligan at Trynday. It's an honor, a privilege, a miracle. It's uh, a curriculum, trynday.com. Get some books. Get all the books. Give them, all, give them to everyone you can. <laughs> what did he do? He loved life and freedom. This is left to right, the Attorney General, a new Senator, and the President of the United States. The Attorney General is standing on his tippy toes because he's shorter than the rest of them. The new Senator is eyeballing the Executive Mansion as if he's really got his heart set on that humorously. And then in the next shot, the short Attorney General crouches down even farther and the Senator goes up on his tippy toes and the President looks a little anguished, like he's not quite sure, gee, are these clowns going to F up this photo op right here? And they all loved life and freedom, I think, to an inestimable amount because of their father, Joseph P. Kennedy. We're going to see a little bit more about him later. And of all the influences that uh, humans have, a strong mother and father certainly count, and this guy counted quite a lot to these men and history and our lives still today. That is Governor Pat Brown having hot coffee poured on his lap, the president next to him cracking up. And as they try to clean it up, the president is still cracking up. And then he sent a picture <laughs> to the to Pat. It only hurts when you laugh. All of the best, John Kennedy. And one day the president was at a beach house on a, a day off just eyeballing the ocean for a while. And then, and they had cleared the beaches to the left and the right. And he just stepped over the little fence and jogged his way down into the water. And the secret service couldn't contain crowds rushing to him at the water. And then this is a picture as he's approaching his way back to the house where, where he was staying. And he just said, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I need to go in the ocean. So he went in the ocean. This man loved life and freedom. And we'll see a little bit more about that throughout but that's the first thing he did and it's the first thing everyone needs to do if you're going to uh enjoy your your sojourn on this planet he also worked for america's ideals from his first moments after being sworn in we observe today not a victory of party but a celebration of freedom symbolizing an end as well as a beginning signifying renewal as well as change for i have sworn before you and almighty god the same solemn oath our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago the world is very different now for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life so in 1961 he could confidently declare we had the power to abolish all forms of human poverty so all the human poverty since 1961 has kind of been intentional. And if you, when you study his administration and you see what he was doing economically for America and the world, this is very literal, in my opinion. And it's a first mark of what we lost. And yet the same revolutionary beliefs, the American ideals for which our forebears fought, are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. We dare not forget today that we are the heirs of that first revolution. It was still at issue around the globe in 1961, and it is certainly at issue around the globe today. So he said, let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage and witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Let the word go forth 
line in the sand. This is what I'm going to do as president. This is what I'm committing the nation to. We will not watch or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed. Not going to do it. He worked for America's ideals. I would say to assure the survival and the success of liberty is America's mission statement. And this is the standard to which we must hold all presidents. And to the extent that they fall short, replace them legally through the ballot box. He also stood up to forces that kill to win. And courage was John F. Kennedy's brand, which we'll see in a few minutes. Like the military industrial complex, three days before he was sworn in, President Eisenhower looked into the camera and warned us about a danger new since World War II, a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. And he said, this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. Spiritual? It's spiritual influence? That would be one mighty influence. He went on. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society, the very structure of our society. Then he said, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Clear and present dangers. I wonder, I'd love to have asked Ike, was this primarily for the benefit of the new young president who is coming into office in three days? Former five-star general, supreme allied commander of the allies in Europe during World War II, responsible for the largest military operation in history, the 1944 invasion of Normandy, supreme allied commander of NATO, and finally, commander in chief of the most powerful military the world had ever known as president of the United States for eight years, Dwight David Eisenhower, in the military from the age of 21, now 70 years old, a friend and collaborator with the most powerful bankers and business owners in the world said about the military industrial complex, we should take nothing for granted. I don't think he could have given a stronger warning and there are many who rightfully throw him under the bus because what were you doing for eight years, Ike? That it came to this under your watch and now three days before you leave, he arguably says the things that he's remembered the most for. So what a, what a confluence, what an, what, a, what an occurrence right here. Get inside his head and how he spent the rest of his life watching what happened to Kennedy and what Johnson did with the military. Then he gave two other warnings that should have been heeded. The technological revolution during recent decades, which has become central, more formalized, complex, and costly, a steadily increasing share is conducted for, by, and at the direction of the federal government. The solitary inventor tinkering in a shop has been overshadowed by task forces of scientists in laboratories and testing fields. The free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research. A government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. Here's the medical tyranny crushing us today with COVID-19 as the excuse. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by, the federal, by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is, every pre is ever present and gravely to be regarded. Policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. It is the task of state statesmanship to mold, to balance, and to integrate these and other forces, new and old, 
within the principles of our democratic system, ever aiming toward the supreme goals of our free society. This is an amazing speech. Most folks know the warning about the military industrial complex. And he was warning us about this element that has us by the throat. And he also warned, he told us to avoid the impulse to live only for today, plundering for our own ease and convenience the precious resources of tomorrow. We cannot mortgage the material assets of our grandchildren without risking the loss also of their political and spiritual heritage. We want democracy to survive for all generations to come, not to become the insolvent phantom of tomorrow. America is arguably the insolvent fulfillment of Eisenhower's warning. We've let ourselves be lulled and terrified away from being alert and knowledgeable. We did not compel our government to pursue the supreme goals of our free society. And to stand up to these forces who kill to win is a model and inspiration worth talking about. Kennedy also stood up to the mob. He won election in November of 60, and he made his brother Bobby attorney general. And after they took office in January 61, Bobby attacked the mob with zeal. In April, Carlos Marcello was arrested and deported to Guatemala on Bobby's orders from the Justice Department, where Marcello was supposedly born. After an ordeal that lasted weeks he, and broke two ribs, Marcello snuck back into the States, burning with hatred for the Kennedys. So it takes an unusual courage. It takes an unusual courage. Kennedy also stood up to the CIA. The Bay of Pigs invasion in April 1961. Kennedy approved the CIA's plan to have anti-Castro Cubans land on the island and cause trouble. Kennedy was told there was a good chance that they would cause an uprising that would remove Castro. The CIA told the invaders if they floundered, Kennedy would use the military to help them. Both of those claims were false. The CIA had no evidence that an uprising was likely. And Kennedy said all along, our military would not be used. He didn't want Cuba's ally, the Soviet Union, to retaliate in a way that would cause a nuclear war, by like conquering West Berlin, for example, a city we were pledged to defend. The upcoming invasion was no secret. Newspapers had reported military activity um, sometimes very accurately about what might be coming. Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty, Pentagon liaison to the CIA, later reported that he had imagined that the CIA let Castro learn plenty for the invasion. The invaders were crushed. Kennedy refused to deploy more force. Our involvement became known nonetheless. Kennedy took responsibility and was humiliated in front of the world. Anti-Castro Cubans felt betrayed. The CIA, the military, and the mob who wanted to return to Cuba and reopen their casinos were enraged. Kennedy was heartsick about the men who died and about the 1,183 survivors imprisoned by Castro. And Kennedy asked those around him, how could he have been so stupid? How could he have trusted CIA and Pentagon men, people he didn't know, just because they were supposed to be experts? He investigated what went wrong, and he found out, according to Kenneth O'Donnell, one of his most trusted aides and many others, that the plan had been a trap. Alan Dulles, CIA director, specifically planned for its failure, as Lisa Pease put it in her great book, A Lie Too Book Big to Fail. Dulles did this to force Kennedy to use enough force to come in, rescue the floundering invaders, and install a new government in Cuba. He made a lot of changes uh, throughout the Pentagon. They didn't really take hold. They didn't have teeth. He issued memorandums that rocked the halls of power, according to Fletcher Prouty, but not quite enough. But eventually he replaced uh, Dulles and a couple others. We'll get to them in a second. And Kennedy gave, this is talk about bucking a system. You know, by 60, 61 here, the CIA had already killed people overseas, toppled a few governments. These, this was a formidable force and Kennedy went nose to nose with them. After this, Kennedy gave our ambassadors overseas authority over all U.S. personnel in their countries, including for the first time the CIA, which in many countries had had bigger budgets and staff, longer relationships with foreign governments than did our diplomats. He forced into retirement Alan Dulles, Charles Cabell, and Richard Bissell, top, the top three guys. 
making enemies of people who, who kill to win. In June, he went to Vienna and he met Nikita Khrushchev, leader of the Soviet Union, who said, um, by the end of the year, we're not gonna, we're gonna block American access to West Berlin, a city we were pledged to uh, protect and defend, causing and starting the Berlin crisis. And Kennedy came back in June and he conferred with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and they were advising, let's do a first strike. And, and Kennedy was dumbfounded. The Soviet Union will respond. We're gonna lose multiple millions of people here and in Europe. And the Joint Chiefs represented the, uh, the idea that, well, that's all right, we'll survive, we'll win, we'll have won. There'll be more of us left than of them. And Kennedy left the room and said, and we call ourselves the human race. So this is, this is, the Joint Chiefs were forces who killed a win that Kennedy confronted. He addressed the nation in July, and he said, um, asking Congress for an extra $3 billion for the, for the armed forces. I want to, we're going to increase the Army's total strength from 875,000 to approximately 1 million. We're going to increase the Navy and the Air Force. I'm ordering our draft calls to be doubled and tripled in the coming months. This was a major crisis. The world grabbed its ankles and, and prayed. And I'm calling up other reserve forces and I'm planning to give uh, extra air transport squadrons. And he told the nation comparable efforts for our common defense are being discussed with our native, native, NATO allies. I am well aware of the fact that many American families will bear the burden of these requests. Studies or careers will be interrupted. Husbands and sons will be called away. Incomes in some cases will be reduced, but these are burdens which must be borne if freedom is to be defended. So here's another example of him talking Turkey to the greatest extent possible without giving away secrets to the American people. And this was part of his brilliance in, he knew he was leading the people and he had to tell us the truth and he had to get us enrolled to understand why we had to bravely defend ourselves and take the stands and not give in to bull bullies. And he had called these bullies bluff. One month later, the Soviet Union started erecting or had the uh, East German regime erect the wall around Berlin, escalating tensions even more. On September 1st, the Soviets conducted the first of 57 nuclear tests they would do over the next few months breaking a vol voluntary moratorium that they in the United States had been observing for three years. And that same month, at the United Nations, Kennedy described the benefits of general and complete disarmament. He described, as he did through his whole three years, the benefits of general and complete disarmament. And he challenged the Soviet Union to a peace race. And we don't hear about disarmament anymore. now. The big honchos of the military industrial complex and the military side and in the, and the giant industries and, and the corporations. Kennedy was a big threat to them, obviously. Also this month, he and Khrushchev started a secret correspondence. I believe Khrushchev initiated it, secretly sending letters back and forth during which they, would, they built trust in fits and starts over the next two years. By the end of the year, Khrushchev backed away from his pledge to block our access to West Berlin because the wall stopped the brain drain. The problem was ambitious, intelligent people of East Germany were coming into little West Berlin that we protected where there was freedom. And that was a great embarrassment to the communist regimes and building the wall to stop that influx, that outflow, ease the tensions. And then we resumed testing too after months of trying to, to stop it. He forced Dulles to retire in November, 1961. And it's come out, it's been discovered, it's, been, it's, it's well known now that after leaving the CIA in his home in Washington, DC, Alan Dulles continued to receive and meet with many of the same people from the CIA, from the Pentagon, from the State Department, from the National Security Agency on a regular basis, plotting and planning what? Plotting and planning what? He, it's, he never really left position of influence. That same November, our military in Berlin positioned tanks, 
So the Soviet Union positioned tanks and there was this standoff for many days at Checkpoint Charlie, which was a dividing line between East and West Berlin. This was a holy beep moment, you know? Someone drops a gun and it goes off. Does it start a whole exchange that, that leads to the whole, the whole shebang? Kennedy and Khrushchev, again, back channels, negotiated a deal, a plan. You pull your tanks back first. We'll pull, I swear, we'll pull ours back 20 minutes later. Yeah, yeah, you will, you will, we will, we will. You sure, you sure, okay. And it happened. And we got pulled back from the brink. 1961, up to the time, was a horrendous year. Someone at the end of the year, someone said, uh, someone wants to interview you. They want to write a book about 1961, your first year in office. And Kennedy said, why? It's, a, it's just a year of disasters. And that December, Joe Kennedy had a stroke that put him in a wheelchair, no longer able to walk, talk, or advise his sons about anything. And 1961 ended with this nation's most rich and powerful, the military, the CIA, mobsters, and anti-Castro Cubans, feeling blocked by the Kennedys and working together. Because the CIA mounted a big secret effort to destabilize, sabotage, and maybe even topple Fidel Castro in Cuba, working in cahoots with the anti-Cuban exiles who hated him, and also with uh, mafia on assassination plots that they kept secret from Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy for a while. And then he found out about it. And they promised him, okay, oh no, we ended those or we're going to shut those down. And they never shut them down. They lied to him. In March, 1962, the Joint Chiefs presented Operation Northwoods, a plan to stage attacks on Americans or on Cubans that could include real casualties, real injuries, real, let's kill real people. It could include passenger planes switched in flight with remote controlled empty replacements, which would be caused to crash. We would say Cuba did it, blew up our planes so we could invade and remove Castro and risk World War III, a full blown nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union. Kennedy rejected the plan. And in October, he replaced Lyman Lemnitz, sir, as the Joint Chiefs. And he replaced him with Maxwell Taylor, who Kennedy admired and who acted as a friend to Kennedy. But according to Fletcher Prouty and others, Taylor was the CIA's man, kind of involved at the, at the table with Kennedy to keep the CIA abreast of, to the best of their ability of what's this president up to? He's, he's very, he's just way, never had a president so independent in history since you know World War II, Truman and Eisenhower, what the CIA was able to do, Kennedy was, wow, he really thinks he's president. He's really trying to oversee us and control us. What a plan. Those who think that our leaders wouldn't do something like 9-11 to start a war need to learn about Operation Northwoods. There it is on paper. It came out in the 1990s, I believe, after uh, the records review was set up after the movie JFK. Come back this way. Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962. We thought 1961 was a dangerous year. In October, the CIA told President Kennedy that the Soviet Union had smuggled nuclear missiles into Cuba. And they said they were not operational, but they soon would be. Then they could hit most of the United States and Central and South America. Many of Kennedy's top advisors told them to bomb those missiles at once, even though the Soviet response might be a full-blown nuclear exchange. Before the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy might have done that. But since then, he was questioning everything more closely and trusting his judgment more exclusively. So this time he and his team devised another plan. They announced to the world the presence of the missiles and demanded they be removed and impose a naval quarantine around Cuba. To stop, that would stop and search incoming Soviet ships. Days of tension followed. The Soviet ships stopped. The US pledged and, they, and the Soviets agreed to remove their, their weapons. 13 days publicly. Uh, no, altogether 13 days. A week it was public. The U.S. pledged not to invade Cuba on the condition that Castro allow the U.N. to inspect the removal of the weapons, and Kennedy secretly promised to remove our missiles from Turkey, which he did a few months later. When, uh, when they knew that Khrushchev was going to remove his weapons and the world was safe, the president said to his brother Bobby, this is the night I should go to the theater referring to Lincoln's assassination after the South surrendered and the North had won the Civil War. Bobby replied, if you go, I want to go with you. 
Decades later, we learned that there were nuclear weapons in Cuba, which we had not detected, which were ready. And former Soviets told us, had we attacked, they would have used those weapons against us, which would have caused that planet-destroying exchange. We also learned that a Soviet submarine captain in the waters around Cuba at one point thought he was under attack and wanted to use his nukes against us, which also would have ignited the world. Another officer on board, pictured here, whose consent was needed to fire their weapons, refused. His name was Vasily Alexandrovich Arkhipov. We might be here because this man said no. Yeah, the Joint Chiefs, there they are. Let's just, let's just go in quickly and bomb them. In June 1963, let me read this. Journalist Norman Cousins told Khrushchev in the spring of 63 that Kennedy wanted a better relationship with the Soviet Union. They had just gone through the Cuban Missile Crisis, and their hearts probably were still pounding by the springtime. And Cousins told Khrushchev that Kennedy was doing all he could to stop raids against Cuba by independent people and CIA-backed exiles. And Khrushchev said, oh, Kennedy wants a fresh start? He wants me to forget the past? Okay, I do. But the next move is up to him. Cousins relayed that to Kennedy when he got back to the States. Kennedy was formulating plans to withdraw from Vietnam without consulting the Joint Chiefs or the CIA, to some extent. I mean, there were a lot of plans that were on the table, but there was, there was more that he kept to himself and did in secret. And after hearing what Khrushchev said, he prepared a speech, also without consulting the chiefs or the CIA, either entirely or not to the extent that he normally did with a big speech, because he wanted to lay this out there. And in this speech, he belittled the idea that enormous stockpiles of expensive weapons were the only means of assuring peace. He said that peace was the necessary rational end of rational men. Our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man, and man can be as big as he wants. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. And our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we are all mortal. I'm not going to read all this, but you should. BrucetyTorres.com, TryAndDay.com. <laughs> um, near the end of his speech, I'm going to read the last paragraph. He said something never mentioned by mainstream commentary about him. He wanted to eliminate the military industrial complex. He said, and is not peace in the last analysis, basically a matter of human rights, the right to live out our lives without fear of devastation, the right to breathe air as nature provided it, the right of future generations to a healthy existence. While we proceed to safeguard our national interests, let us also safeguard human interests, and the elimination of war and arms is clearly in the interest of both. This man, with his hand on the steering wheel, was trying to turn it in a different direction after 20 years of arms buildup, beginning with World War II. 20 years of huge budgets poured into these corporations, contractors, and ballooning the armed services, bursting at the seams and happy to find and create more enemies for more wars, for more investment, for more money, for more enemies and more wars, more investment for more everything. Everything we've say, seen since President Kennedy was taken out. He wanted to redirect it. At the end of his speech, he said, the United States, as the world knows, will never start a war. Clear your throat, get up off the floor if you fell off your chair. The United States, as the world knows, will never start a war. We do not want a war. We do not now expect a war. This generation of Americans has already had enough, more than enough, of war and hate and oppression. We shall be prepared if others wish it. We shall be alert to try to stop it. But we shall also do our part to build a world of peace where the weak are safe and the strong are just. We are not helpless before that task or hopeless of its success. Confident and unafraid, we must labor on, not toward a strategy of annihilation, but toward a strategy of peace. I say disarmament is possible when you're not at war. If you make your living from war, disarmament is the enemy. 
Kennedy was killed five months after saying the United States will never start a war. Under Johnson, the United States started a big one in Vietnam. In September, between that speech and September, and the United Nations, the United States and the Soviet Union and the United Kingdom, I believe, created and signed a treaty, the first of its kind, to limit, uh, to, to uh, no longer test uh, nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, on land, or in the water. You could only do it underground. It was the first of its kind. And it was a huge lessening of tensions. In August and September, people were talking about, is the, is the Cold War going to end? Is this actually happening? And Kennedy made a great big plea for it here at the United Nations. In late September, they signed this treaty. Again, first of its kind. Kennedy considered it the greatest accomplishment of his administration up to that time. He thought he was probably going to have another five years. I have to move this i don't have any page indicator there yay and then in october he issued national security action memorandum 263 boom, 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 boom. the first step to pull out of vietnam he ordered the withdrawal of 1000 men by christmas and indicated the intent to withdraw the rest by 1965. It's rather conclusive now that that is what he was going to do, and he wasn't going to, we were not going to have the war we had in the 1960s. On October 19th, in Boston, Kennedy, des Kennedy described many trends that were making the world safer and more prosperous. He said, if we maintain our responsibilities, he saw no reason why the strength of freedom should not increase. And those who hope for a world of diversity, a world of free choice, a world of freedom should be disappointed. He said, I think the United States here and abroad is moving into its brightest period. This is the chance that we have. This was one month before he was killed. That was his assessment of the state of the country and the state of the world. Under his leadership after three years, coming to the brink more than once and working for peace, he was able to say, I believe the United States is facing its brightest period. And then in early November, first weekend in November, there was report, an FBI informant told the Secret Service in Chicago where President Kenny was going to visit the first weekend of November. There's an assassination plot there. It was so real, and they found so much to prove it that Kennedy canceled his trip, and a bogus excuse was given to uh, the press, a, very, a serious excuse, but it was still. And the FBI informant identified himself as Lee, and we now know, we've known for years, Lee Harvey Oswald, this man was a patriot, a hero, an intelligence asset used by the FBI, used by the CIA, and uh, you, and also the, under the Office of Naval Intelligence, maybe in combined things, maybe they loaned him out, this, that, and the other thing. This man was a patriot and a hero, and he was set up to take the fall. In Tampa, where Kennedy went, November 18th, four days before he was killed in Dallas, they had just gotten the all clear from another plot that they had found about, so Kennedy felt safe enough to stand up in an open car in Tampa, which still had an element of risk to it because just because they say the uh, threat is cleared, is it really? And on November 22nd, he rode through Dallas. And what I want to tell you about multiple shooters and the reality of a conspiracy is best summed up by listening to this. Kennedy was hit in the throat, the back, and the head. Being shot from the front and the back, and the back proves there were multiple shooters. Connolly was hit by a fourth shot, and the shot that Nick James Tagg makes five. But it seems irrefutable, based on the work of David Mantic over the last few decades, that Kennedy was hit 
three times in the head by shots that hit almost simultaneously. And so that would make the new total six shots. Multiple shooters equals a conspiracy. There are six shots right there. But Connolly may have been hit more than once. So that would, excuse me, that would have been seven shots. Connolly, if Connolly was hit more than once, that would be eight. A bullet was found in the grass in the shooting zone. That's nine. Another seems to have dented the windshield frame of the limo near the rearview mirror. That's 10. A bullet hole in the windshield seen later at the hospital and that night in Washington might have been the shot that hit Kennedy in the throat, or it could have been another. That's 11. The sidewalk at the scene had a new scar after the shooting that seemed to be caused by a bullet. That's 12. And there were more. A number of people, including policemen, saw bullets strike the pavement around the president's car. Some heard two or three bursts of gunfire. Secret Service agent Ray, Roy Kellerman in the front seat next to Kennedy's driver said the assassination ended with a flurry of shells coming into the car. It was a wild shooting zone. It wasn't three little bullets from a rinky-dink man liquor carcano up on the sixth floor. That's what he did. He loved life and freedom. He worked for America's ideals. And he stood up to forces that kill to win. How did he do it? By living each day as if it were his last. He was reconciled. But his health was so precarious, literally any, any healthy day might be his last because he didn't know if his systems would collapse and he'd be in the hospital any evening. And he talked about it. You got to live each day as if it's your last. Illnesses almost took him many times, starting when he was two. He spent days, weeks, and months as a boy, a teen, and a man in bed, at home, and in hospitals. Months. Think about that. Months. Months in bed. Months. He said he spent a year in hospitals after the war. Maybe not the first 12 consecutive months after the war, but within, within a couple of years that he spent 12 months must have. That's what he said. He spent a year in hospitals. He also did it by pursuing excellence and hats off to this man, Joseph P. Kennedy, his father, who the president quoted as saying, things do not happen. They are made to happen. So the president lived each day as if it were his last, and he pursued excellence. And he also developed and trusted his judgment. All that time in bed and in hospitals, much of it was spent reading, often histories and biographies, because his father was a hard charger who talked about be the best, be the best, be number one, be the best. And this man, John F. Kennedy, took that on. Not immediately. He was pretty reckless and uh, liked a lot of shenanigans when he was a young man, but very quickly he buckled in to be that competitive. And he studied life, history, and everyone else that he could. His father helped him publish as a book his senior year thesis about why England slept during the 1930s while Nazi Germany was rearming. And through his connections in Hollywood, there's good old Spencer Tracy, happy to get an autograph from this 20-something son of this millionaire uh, ambassador to uh, Great Britain. Kennedy was, in, was such a physical wreck, he was turned down by the armed services, but his father pulled strings to get him into the Navy. And after a while at a safe desk job, they, he, Kennedy, the, the John Kennedy, forced his way and got the help to become the captain of a PT boat, which I say would bounce on the waves like a bucking bronco. And this man had a horrible back even back then. That couldn't have been too pleasant. And his old friend Death showed up in the summer of 43 when the PT boat was smashed by a Japanese ship. And that was a 10-day ordeal where John Kennedy swam around a lot at night, you know, trying to 
trying to find some kind of contact so his men could get rescued and they were finally rescued. And that uh, was written up toward the end of the war, 44, 45. And young John Kennedy became well known for his courage and his hard work to save his men. Courage and relentlessness became his brand. In 1946, he worked so hard campaigning and he had a lot of help and a lot of money from his father and he became a congressman. And Joe Kennedy, his father, watched him shaking hands and campaigning and told a friend next to him, that's something I never thought I ever would have seen because his son, John, in many ways, liked life a little too much, liked to party maybe a little bit too much and was blown away by how hard his son worked to win that election and every election that he ran since. In the early 1950s, he went to uh, Indochina, as it was called, what's now Vietnam and Laos, and learned what he could about what's the situation over there, because we were coming in to protect and fund and back the regimes over there that the French were losing to the uh, native resistance. And Kennedy said, we have allied ourselves to the desperate effort of a French regime to hang on to the remnants of empire, which was against America and the CIA's stand and policy over there. In 1952, he became senator. His brother Bobby was his campaign manager. I'll bet you anything this picture was taken for home consumption. Bobby laughing at the news that John F. Kennedy uh, is running for U.S. senator. In the mid-50s, his, ba his back was so bad that he underwent an operation that the doctor said, this has just as much chance that it, could, that it could kill you. This is such a risky operation. And the pain was so bad that uh, Kennedy did the operation anyway, and it provided no relief. But he was able to write Profiles in Courage. And at this point, he was very strategically thinking. He knew around 1960 he was going to run for office or thinking about it by in 54, 55, when he wrote this book. And he already had the brand of courage because of the PT-109 incident. So he published this, this book. And that speech at the bottom right, or there's Marx as senator on behalf of Algerian independence, which was a big pain in the ass to Eisenhower and the State Department and the CIA, that John F. Kennedy was talking about letting other nations do exactly what we did when we broke away from Great Britain, honoring America's ideals authentically with integrity. It's not just lip service. You could argue most other uh, presidents or congressmen, they say that that's what we want for other nations, but we don't. We exploit them as any horrible empire colonizer ever has. And he truly was relentless. In his inauguration at the UN, his peace speech, but especially during the 64 press conferences that he gave throughout his presidency. And I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't watched or listened to all 64, you've got a treat in store for you. Like Harry Truman said, the only thing new in the world is the history you don't know. I say this in my book, Kennedy demonstrated his worth and accounted to us on live television about twice a month in 64 press conferences. He often described how the Constitution limited his power and how the American people needed to know and support what was happening for things to improve. His respect for the reporters and theirs for him in this age of immaturity must be seen to be believed. Did someone say he was a good teacher? He ended one conference with class dismissed, which caused a burst of laughter. He was one of our most popular shows. For the three years of his presidency, twice a month, he was one of America's most popular shows. The familiarity created by his press conferences made Kennedy's death, I say, feel like a family member's, and that's corroborated by people who lived through it, who lived through those times. When I ask elders what they thought of Kennedy then and what they think of him now, they say things like, oh, I just loved him. I thought he was terrific. I thought he was going to change everything. Or they say the country has never been the same. What a waste. What a shame. The mainstream rarely mentions President uh, Kennedy's press conferences. It mentions his debates with Nixon and moves on. 
typically saying that Kennedy was mostly style with little substance. He's portrayed as a silly little boy in the movie The Butler. Bad times at the, at the El Royale implies that he hurt a woman during sex. In Jackie, he is short and pushed aside by a falsely taller brother, Bobby. The movie 13 Days shows him to be smart and strong. One wonders if it has more than Kevin Costner in common with Oliver Stone's movie JFK. Authority does not want us to know that the praise heaped upon Kennedy by peers and a freer press and a better educated people was earned. He was solving real problems, increasing our say in everything, clearing the way to prosperity, confronting the military industrial complex. Under his leadership, our political system, productivity, trade balance, dollar value, standard of living, culture, and values were the envies of the world. Economists were studying how to get the surplus food we were producing to those who needed it. Some sociologists were imagining how we would spend the extra leisure time we might soon have, working fewer hours for higher wages if certain trends were held. Compare that to everything we've had since Johnson took over, with the millions killed in our wars, including those we foster in and between nations, like the Iran-Iraq war of the 1980s, during which we sold assistance to both sides and about 1.5 million people died, and we see what we lost with Kennedy. He was relentless. He lived each day as if it were his last. My goodness. That's the coconut on which he uh, wrote the message that saved him and his crew from uh, their uh, suffering during the PT-109 thing. It's a memento. It's a memento more. Uh, we've seen in, uh, civil in history a skull on one's desk to remind people, you too will die. It helps our decision making. On his last night in Fort Worth, pictured here, he demonstrated when they were back up in their hotel room and they were talking about, oh, the night we just had, whoa, the wonderful people we met. He demonstrated to his wife, Jackie, how a man who had approached them earlier that evening could have shot him with a pistol had he wanted to. The next morning, discussing the dangers of Dallas, where he would, they would go around noon, he told her if someone wanted to shoot him from a window with a rifle, no one could stop him, so why worry about it? Aware of these plots around him, was he preparing Jackie, should the worst happen, and pre-comforting her by showing her that he knew what he was doing and that he had met his rendezvous with death with his eyes wide open? That's what he did. And that's how he did it. He loved life and freedom. He worked for America's ideals. He stood up to forces that kill to win. And he did it by living each day as if it were his last. Pursuing excellence and developing and trusting his judgment. Why we must do these things. Because of what's happening on our planet. Picture a swastika covering that whole planet. That's what's happening. We have to change our path because we are being fleeced, at least definitely in the good old USA we are. In 2017, the Pentagon admitted we can't find or account for $21 trillion. Oops, we can't find it. What can be staged and put on the news that looks really, really believable if you've got a budget of $21 trillion? What events can you cause all over worldwide? Let the answer, anything you want. Trillions have been poured into our economy, straining conditions that are ready to burst and collapse. 
just since the pandemic, I believe. I believe it tops a trillion. But economically, our systems are straining to the bursting collapsing point. We must change our path. Billions have been made by tech and pharma companies as we were locked down over the, just the last few years. And at least 100 billion has been sent to Ukraine. Smedley Butler, where are you? Great book. Get it. We must change our path in order to be sane, empowered, and satisfied to deal with reality. And here is a great teaching tool, a recent lecture by Cynthia Chung on the Rising Tide Foundation YouTube channel called The Battle for the Mind, How to Exit an Artificial Reality. Watch it, love it, share it with everybody that you can, because we are the victims, our culture is, our society is of psychological warfare by forces that kill to win. And if we don't see through it and, and practice how to compensate for it, we will be led by the nose off the cliffs that they are taking us toward. We also need to do what Kennedy did so we can recreate America. This is the classic three out structure of any story. You can lay it on any good story and see hmm, act one, act two, act three, pretty clearly with those major plot points at the end of act one and at the end of uh, act two. For instance, the Wizard of Oz, the protagonist, Dorothy, who experiences all this. So we are Dorothy looking at this and experiencing all this meets typically their nemesis in act one. The tornado is the plot point at the end of act one that throws the story into a big adventure from which the hero must claw and find her way back to restore the balance or get revenge or solve whatever the problem is. And melting the witch is how act two ends, but the story doesn't end until Dorothy discovers that she can click her heels and get home. Beginning, middle and end. This is America. Skull and Bones was formed in 1832. They represent everything in the shadows that subverts reality, subverts our democracy, subverts the power of we the people. The plot point at the end of Act One was the American Civil War, which fundamentally changed what we were created to be, the balance between state and federal power. And the nemesis, the forces, the corporate forces, the power forces, the forces in the shadows ballooned through Act Two until the confrontation with John F. Kennedy in 1963 and took him out. And America crashed and died with 9-11 and the creation of the Department of Homeland Security and the USA Patriot Act. The boot's been on our face ever since. Because if we don't have our constitutional rights and live under the Constitution, we're not America. To be America and call ourselves Americans, we have to live under the Constitution and have our constitutional rights honored. If that's going to happen, we have to make that happen. It's up to us. Things don't happen. They're made to happen. We have to make that happen relentlessly, like a Kennedy. We have to do all that. Why we must to also give future generations a chance. This is a great video on the Truth Stream Media channel called King of the World, the high symbolism of Charles III's coronation. And it not only lists chapter and verse history of the previous two King Charles's, but now this third one coming online, coming around, who has just come around, um, is following a legacy of unacceptable tyranny against which our forebears fought during the revolution in partnership with this fellow klaus schwab it's imperative more people everybody learn about the world economic forum and their plans and this video an hour and 50 minutes not only gives that history of tyranny and britain britain and uh, the uh, king charles but also well teaches the agenda where we're being led and how our future future generations have no chance unless more of us spread the word and do things about this so he, let me got to move my little thing here. He loved life and freedom. He worked for America's ideals and he stood up to forces that kill to win by living each day as if it were his last.
What would you do if it's your last day? You know what? You'd pour your heart and soul into it. You'd give everything you'd got. You'd put it, you'd leave nothing behind. You'd put it all on the table. There's, there may not be a tomorrow. You have to do and say it all today. He pursued excellence and he developed and trusted his judgment. And why we must is we have to change our path. We speed toward cliffs to be sane, empowered, satisfied, to enjoy life, to recreate America and give future generations a chance. How will you do it? How will you love life and freedom, work for America's ideals and stand up to forces that kill to win? How will you do it? I'm not gonna tell you, because General Patton said, never tell them how. You will be amazed at their ingenuity. Never tell your men how. Never tell them how, I need a bridge. You don't tell them how to build it and tell them you need it in 12 hours. They'll come back in 11 and say, here's your bridge, sir. Never tell them how. But I don't work for General Patton, so I'm going to tell you how. I want you to love the truth. I want you to just love it. That's all you have to do. And spread it. Talk about it all the time. Let it do the work. I used to ask people 15 years ago, in a stranger, small talk, business networking, you know, when the, when the work was done, Hey, do you know anyone who uh, thinks or believes that 9-11 uh, was an inside job? Muslims had nothing to do with it. And then I'd eat the hors d'oeuvre and just see what happened. Today, it's with our friends and family and coworkers. Do you know anyone who's convinced that the, uh, the vaccines are uh, killing and injuring people at a scale unreported on the mainstream media? And then sip your coffee and see what happens. We have to have that kind of courage. We have to have that Kennedy-esque kind of courage to do that in order to save ourselves, our families, and our and, uh, and hum humanity. And here's some equipment for you. Near-death experiences, study those. Because Kennedy <clears throat> lived life as each day as if it were his last. That's possible if you have no fear of death. And one way to develop that is to hear what people who've had near-death experiences say about what's on the other side. When you see a parade of witnesses testify to something, your own imagination starts to kick in. And part of life is thinking thoughts that give us power. So I say it makes it really better to be a human to have a spiritual imagination. What you imagine doesn't have to be true, but if you can imagine it, and there's tons of evidence and testimony along these lines. Here's another tactic, get up and write, get up earlier in the morning and write, get this book. The artist's way. It's got some exercises in it. It's got thousands of raving fan, lunatic fans for the last 30 years about how it jump starts their creativity. And people went on to write voluminous, wonderful things, real life solutions, nuts and bolts, prob solutions for their businesses, or even creative endeavors, or even self therapy. And you figure yourself out. The Oracle at Delphi, know thyself. Our mind is a raging fire, playwright David Mamet said. We have got to conquer ourselves in order to be able to enjoy life. Get up and write and, and figure yourself out. Figure who you are. Figure out who your values are. What do I really love? What do I really want? If today were my last day, what would I literally really do? And finally, get used to saying these words. You'll feel very shy at first. Non-alcoholic beer. Your mind is your only tool. It's your only tool. And we can't afford to cloud it. And this is my personal experience, how much better my life is. I was a casual drinker. I was a social drinker. Who isn't? I often feel I'm the only one I know who's clean and sober. No drugs, no alcohol. And it takes, you get Snickers, it starts a conversation. You're outed. I'll have a wine, I'll have a this, I'll have a this. And you ask, do you have any non-alcoholic beer? Whoa. Who cares? You get to wake up as spry as you possibly can the next day. Relentless. He stood for the freedom and dignity of man. To do likewise is to use his memory for all it's worth. He's getting the last word. This is how he ended his inaugural address. His presidency proved he meant every word. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. 
I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country could do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Finally, whether you are citizens of America or citizens of the world, ask of us here the same high standards of strength and sacrifice which we ask of you. With a good conscience, our only sure reward, with history the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. That's all she wrote. I guess Bruce. I stop shit, right? Yeah, stop shit. That was absolutely beautiful. That was exactly, I, I know that JFK is smiling. His spirit was revived in a very, very real way. And I think that one thing that, that has been, I think, one of the greatest uh, injustices against JFK has been the, the transforming of what he was in the minds of younger generations into sort of this mythical, uh, mythical, untouchable figure beyond human, um, this Camelot Arthur-like person who it becomes very difficult when when you think of them in this way and they do the same thing to lincoln if they're not slandering they do the other extremes right either yeah. pure pure light or <laughs> pure hypocritical darkness um but but you but it's not human it's not something that you can identify with but what you've done is really demonstrate that this what made jfk exceptional and the reason why i think even to this very day his his memory strikes fear in the hearts of oligarchs to this very day i'm sure it does is because he was a human being, but a human being who was able to walk through the fire. And as you pointed out, I think that the point, the zeroing in on the, the fact of our mortality is something which everybody should have the, the ability to confront and process as part of our growth experience, but so few because of the oligarchical conditioning and the there's all sorts of barriers that have been put to block us from that process of matura maturation that it doesn't seem possible to identify with somebody who's been through the fire. And you did that in such a beautiful, loving way. Really good stuff. There might be a, a couple of items I, I have to maybe snip out for the YouTube friendly version. <laughs> um, but we have a couple of questions that have been uh, building up in the in the chat box. And the first person who got in there was uh, Peter, who's got a multifaceted question. Um, Peter, Nikita, go for it. Matt, uh, thank you, Bruce. You're, I see your full presentation was totally on fire and full of moral, moral fire. And uh, in honor of the occasion, I put on my uh, ball cap from the Navy, from the ship that I served on, and I do have a, a pencil print of JFK. And I would say that uh, I did uh, commit to service in the Navy on account of uh, of him and his, and his example. And I, I think that I'm, I'm looking for the, the question, uh, Okay, what analogs existed in JFK's administration for spiritual and mental fitness to the President's Council on Physical Fitness? And a question I had was, how well did the Peace Corps advance the USA that manifested FDR's four freedoms and good neighbor efforts in spite of the military industrial complex? And I had another uh, observation, which is not a question, but on the uh, value of learning how Joseph and Rose Kennedy succeeded as parents, but perhaps another time. The physical fitness uh, efforts that he made as president were um, continuing, I think, the branding of him as a vital and strong man. His original branding, in a way, was PT-109. You know, he, he towed an injured man for hours 
with a strap in his teeth to get to the first island, which was their refuge. And then many nights he swam in the shipping lanes at night to, tr to maybe get picked up and had some semi-conscious kind of like floating around. He almost went out into the currents that took him to the ocean, but he survived. But he was a physically frail, weak, sick man. So for him to have the President's Council on Physical Fitness was an effort of will on his part, but it was also to counter what, you know, the truth of his frail health that I bet he knew would leak out. And in fact, it was in some of his later campaigns, um, an issue of great contention, but it invigorated a generation, you know, like you were inspired to join the Navy, due in some or all part to him and his example, the whole, you know, his the, many in that generation were, were, you know, inspired by him in many, many ways. The second point you said was Peace Corps. That, you know, quickly in the Peace Corps, he got, Sergeant Shriver was in charge of it and we reported within the first year to the, to the president. Um, it looks like the CIA is trying to plant some people in the Peace Corps and he's, and Kennedy said, get them out of there, get them out of there. No, it really, um, not only inspired young Americans, but it did great in my reading. It did great. It had a great benefit and effect uh, worldwide as part of the authenticity and how he was loved worldwide. When he died, within hours, streets, buildings, boulevards, bridges, lakes, rivers were, were named after him. And the world, the world mourned. Because we had just been through 1961 with the Berlin crisis and the Cuban Missile Crisis, and that's after years of the U U.S. and Soviet Union being nose to nose. You know, everyone was was really terrified that wow, we're, we might really see these mushroom clouds all over the place. So the Peace Corps was a tremendous. And the third thing, oh, his the parent thing. We're here because I got completely fascinated by JFK. I was studying the assassination as part of you know, the outrages of true history that I was obsessed about. But I couldn't stop reading about John F. Kennedy and it's, it's his great, greatness that he was the real deal along all these lines. And it is absolutely fascinating to imagine his childhood by all the accounts, they were nine of them, so and they all had extended families. So there's tons of memoirs, tons of biographies, tons of interviews to see and piece together like what the father modeled and what the mother modeled in terms of this aspect of pursuing excellence. And that was about the protocols and the manners and the, the niceties of everything. But don't you know, it really informed the whole, the whole family. And um, got to say this about all this too. Someone close to them, it may have been Gore Vidal, may have been somebody else said that Jack and Jackie were actors. It may have been Lem Billings. He said they were actors because they were earthy, real, regular people but their presentation, okay? They, they walked the talk. They knew, he especially knew, how to seem and appear to earn the credibility and your vote to be president of the United States and backed it up with policies, starting as a congressman working just for his district and as a senator just working for his state and then the nation and then as president for the nation and the world it's a phenomenal, heroic accomplishment and completely in, intentional. And the, his acceptance of death, Matthew, as you began, I think contributes to the serenity, the unflappability that you perceive studying Kennedy, that his contemporaries and the reporters who followed him reported on. And to what degree was it the amphetamines he was getting stuck into his bloodstream? I don't know. But I say this in my book about that accusation. That's practically the worst thing you could say about him. I hear in a few of his press conferences, his thoughts run a little fast. That's about it. And the men around him said for years afterwards, he was always the calmest, the coolest, the most perceptive and the most practical man among us. And he had assembled the best and the brightest that Lyndon Johnson co-opted and took off the cliff in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. There, <clears throat> the, uh, the thing that I personally was introduced to through just your lecture um, in, a, in a more serious way, I mean, you, when you read JFK and his brother's writings, you see the, the influence 
of the father Joe as having been very great in both men's minds. But then, you know, you do the the geopolitical analysis and look at Joe's role in so many nefarious oper operations, and it's like a bit of a cognitive dissonance. But then the question is, well, um, we, we, we often, and I, I find myself at various times in my life also having jumped the gun and, and missed the nuance of what somebody who is a, a noble person with good intentions sometimes has to do when they're playing a rigged game that is a corrupt game but with the intention of having a, a longer term outcome um, win out. And Joe Kennedy seems to have been, would you say that Joe uh, has, is he somebody who was, who lived sort of a, a dual life as, as somebody who, who couldn't reconcile something in themselves? Or do you think he was a, a fully or a, a well-rounded noble soul in your, in your assessment who is maybe mischaracterized or misjudged as being, um, a more corrupt person than he really was. I was I've been on the fence for years, as you just described about Joe, until working for Chris Milligan, the publisher of Trine Day, who has studied this stuff for decades. And he recently reiterated that's that, for instance, the claim that Joseph bought the mob in Chicago to help with the 1960 election. Chris Milligan says that's bunk. That is Disinformation meant to smear as there is so much about the Kennedys. And yet at the same time, Chris Milligan says that in his smuggling, Joe Kennedy didn't, didn't mind throwing uh, peons overboard if the, the, the heaviness of the boat in the water filled with bootleg booze attracted the Coast Guard to lighten the boat instead of throwing the booze overboard, supposedly Joe Kennedy threw some young Cubans overboard. So I, you know, as much as I'd like to think every slant, not slander, but every horrible story about Joe Kennedy could be uh, misinformation on the general Kennedy smear campaign. Uh, and I, some, this is one of the areas where sometimes I don't, I don't remember what I know or have concluded because I just have read and continued to read and listen to and see so much about this stuff. I see uh, Casey Quinlan. Are you still on this? I want to throw this to you to comment on this point. We're talking about Joe Kennedy, please. How are you? Let me unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Bruce. Can I introduce you, Casey? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Casey's one of the three amigos of Project JFK CSI. Been studying this and teaching this for decades. I'm honored to call him a friend. Well, Bruce, thank you very much. And uh, is it Matt? Matt, thank you very much for getting me on here. Uh, fantastic program. And uh, to all you ladies and gentlemen who don't have his book, I can guarantee you it is a book that you must get. And I can give you about 1,600 other books that I've already read in the past six, 60 years. But Bruce is up there in the top five, and I just want to let him know that uh, what a fantastic presentation about the moral value of our society that we don't see very much today. Uh, and I, I'll make a real quick comment about that because I know we can probably go deeper and deeper and I sure as heck don't want to divide up Republicans and Democrats. Maybe we ought to just have independent Americans. But the idea that uh, uh, our country's going to hell in a handbasket, well, guys, I think we're already in hell. We were in hell back in 1963 the handbasket has exploded. It's down at the bottom of whatever ocean it is. And we're going to reap whatever, whatever we're going to reap here in the next uh, two years. Uh, it's, it, our, our country is a mess. And I hate to say that. I'm a Vietnam veteran. Uh, but but we are, we're in a mess. And I don't know where we're going. The extreme right has taken over. And the bad part about it, people will sit back and they'll say, well, wait a minute. Can you explain what the swamp is? I said, geez, oh. I said, if, if, if you're looking at, at, at Bruce, your explanation about the CIA, that's, that's part of the swamp. Uh, that, that swamp uh, came out of the OSS during World War II, and it just got bigger with the banks, with corporate elites, and uh, we have passed laws that basically have excluded the, uh, uh, the middle class and the lower class almost to the point where we have the haves and the have-nots. And that's what a lot of 
people have been ex trying to explain about what our society is about. But if you're going to go to the Kennedy assassination, you really have to go back to World War II. You have to, uh, you have to look at the OSS. You have to look at uh, MI6, British intelligence. And you have to look at the Obwehr, which is uh, the German intelligence, Ger German former intelligence, and the mixture of all three of those, which was brought into the United States under the auspices of the CIA and the National Security Act. But then you have to go to just a little bit to the right, and a little bit to the right is back at the end of 1944, William William Donovan and um, uh, Alan Dulles and uh, uh, Stevenson from British Intelligence created a uh, created a uh, an outsource, and that outsource was the World Commerce Corporation. Casey, that, uh, could I could I ask you to maybe focus on the the original question I wanted to throw at you as yeah, to go how, ahead, throw it at me. Yeah. What, how what awful it? how awful a criminal criminal may Joseph Kennedy have been, and then we'll come back to you because I want to. Do is I want to let Matthew bring in any other questions that might be going. If sure. Yeah. Could. Joseph we could, Kennedy. Well, you know, I think uh, I, I think Joseph Kennedy. Um, uh, he was a criminal bootlegger. There's no doubt in my mind on that. I think there's a lot of material that you've covered and also other people have covered over the years. Uh, the idea whether or not he purchased or bought uh, the possibility of elections or electors in either West Virginia or Chicago. Uh, you know, that's also up in the air. It's also for, for up, up for uh, um, interpretation. But and I, I want to then I want to thank you, Casey, because the, the original question was was so brief, just like, hey, Joseph Kennedy, the influence of the parents. And in large part, maybe what John and Robert did, the sons did was because the father said, you guys don't have to worry about money, but you have to you have to do good with this legacy and this opportunity about being wealthy, not having to worry about money and living in this great country because he taught them patriotic appreciation from day one. He gave tours as a college student of Boston, the patriotic areas entrepreneur. He could find a way to charge anybody anything for anything. But um, there's no doubt that Joseph Kennedy freed the boys up to pursue um, excellence, quality, whatever they wanted it to do and not have to worry about making a living. Matt, I want to go back to you to look for any more questions. Oh, yeah. And I'll just say, Casey, um, I might call upon you at some point to maybe delve more deeply into the Permindex uh, side of things as well. Bloomfield, Stevenson, the whole uh, shebang. If you're OK with that, I can see that that's where your mind uh, was moving. So let's uh, let's have a conversation if you're OK with that in the future. Sure, that's fine. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Okay, yeah, so there was a uh, Monty was waiting for a while. Monty, are you still there? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Bruce. Very much appreciated the talk. Uh, I lived a lot of this history. I remember when I was in the seventh grade on the playground when it was announced uh, JFK's passing, and uh, shortly thereafter, I ended up in Vietnam myself, which, uh, but out of both of these tragedies uh, came some hope. And uh, uh, I, I think. Uh, uh, JFK laid some seeds for this, not only on the, the history that preceded him in so far as his recognition of something, uh, but though thereafter, what people that came thereafter. And in, in, in particularly, I think there's four inflection points. On uh, 20 September 1963, uh, JFK gave a speech in which he proposed a joint venture to the moon with the USSR. Now, I find this uh, absolutely phenomenal in that it uh, is particularly right after the, basically the Bay of Pigs and coming close to nuclear war that this he had the foresight and the recognition of how to bring something there uh, with what was perceived as an enemy. And I think uh, historically, Abraham Lincoln did much the same with the Russians' uh, intervention in the Civil War, FDR. Uh, very much the same in so far as his close relationship with Stalin and Stalin being convinced that he died. Uh, and I, I bought this up on a forum, which was very well received. Uh, uh, thereafter, Lyndon LaRouge also proposed a joint venture with the Russians uh, for the Strategic Defense Initiative, 
which it also got bamboozled and, and sabotaged. But interestingly enough, in my fight to try to overcome this anti-Russian hysteria, it's interesting that uh, even today, I think this legacy of these people yet lives in that what you're witnessing now, at least insofar as my perception with the Russians and the Chinese, with the BRICS and the SCO and Basically, what I'm seeing here, and I'd be interested in a little bit of feedback, I'm seeing really a resurrection on their part with the basic tenets of what they're doing with internal improvements in Land Bridge and the Silk Road, or resurrection what used to be known in the 19th century as the American system of political economy, which, of course, JFK was actively working on that, too, with the space pro program. So any comments on this, I would welcome. Thank you. Yes, uh, how much I have learned and Matthew Eret has put my head on straight about all of the above. Matthew, it's yours to talk about that stuff. <laughs> oh, Bruce, this is your show, man. Um, all I would say is, Monty, I, I concur. <laughs> I concur with your analysis. <laughs> and yeah, the, the, the precedent, the precedent... The, the principle at JFK was invoking as far as a reawakening of a constitutional American system of political economy that all of the great American leaders had uh, who died while in office, all great American presidents, including Bobby Kennedy. When you actually look at what Bobby Kennedy's policies would have been that he was calling for had he been elected and he would have been elected in 68 as president, we're all invoking the exact same principle of of. Um, a, a way of thinking about your internal domestic and foreign policy around, um, well, you know, what, what LaRouche has, has spoken about, what I've tried to write about, what history demonstrates as, as national economic, uh, national economic policymaking, which situates your, your self-identity as a nation state in harmony with other nations working on common interest projects that, that uplift the quality of life of everybody by building things together for the future generations. And that could take on a variety of, of, uh, of characteristics. But the, the idea is that morality and moral principles have to govern the behavior of economics and the unification of personal self-interest with the well-being of the whole is always what is, what is geared uh, towards as, as far as your, the development of your citizenry. And JFK was doing that. Today, we see the precedent being invoked by a lot of the Eurasian states. Um, who are saying no to the depopulation agenda. So Monty, yeah, I mean, what you're what you're pointing out and, and JFK's insight towards looking at Russia as an ally to break the Cold War by mutually developing new discoveries and applying them with new technologies um, around the idea of a joint space program. Um, yeah, totally. That that's the that's the right spirit and thinking. Yeah. Um, Stephen had a question on, uh, I think, finance and uh, and a bit more. Stephen. Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, Bruce, super lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to the book. Most of what I've learned about the JFK thing was from uh, Dr. Farrell's book, um, which gets into a, a coalition of interests as the subtitle. So I almost get the sense that JFK understood the nature of the deep state or the military industrial complex because he seemed to be attacking it uh, on so many uh, vital points, if you will, and, and hence the coalition of interest that came against him. Um, one of those reputedly were the bankers, you know, Federal Reserve types, central bankers, whatever. Uh, I know that uh, JFK's executive order, I think it's 11, 11 zero, uh, was supposedly bringing in U.S. Treasury notes versus Federal Reserve notes. And there was perhaps a silver gold uh, dimension to that too. I was wondering if, if you could share your thoughts on that aspect of, in terms of the coalition of interest against JFK. Yeah, there's, um, well, about that particular issue for years, that was my understanding from many, many sources that that executive order, um, that he was issuing treasury notes. And I, I think that's indisputable. But as far as interpreting that to mean he was going to replace the Federal Reserve, forgive me, I don't remember the source, but it seemed really credible from a source I respected that said, no, it wasn't that far at all. So maybe he was just setting up competition and down the road, it would have, you know, helped us to a great de degree. Indisputably, the biggest and the richest of, of Wall Street and corporate America uh, solidified in the plot against him. Now, that doesn't mean every big corporate banking interest, but certainly 
um, to the uh, up to the Rockefellers. And I, and I say that from a few books, a, a new one last year, I think it was last year, a, uh, a Coup in Dallas by Hank Al Borelli, um, The Devil's Chessboard by David Talbot, and JFK and the Unspeakable by James Douglas, and even the great, even Crossfire by Jim Mars from the 1980s, revised and updated by 20 something, um, really flesh out the oil interest in uh, Texas, and this latest one, Coup in Dallas, the international things uh, along the line that Casey started getting into and Matt picked up on the Perm Index and the international elements behind the assassination. Um, the oil depletion, I don't think Kennedy activated a change in that, but he was still threatening to do it. And, um, but I got to say this. And this is from Chris Milligan, my publisher, and also my boss. He, I do his mar I do marketing for Trine Day. He says the the assassination was planned years in advance, even before Kennedy was president. He saw he sees ducks put in a row years before the presidency. Along these lines, the people in the shadows, as Chris Milligan calls them, best typified by good old members of Skull and Bones for decades and decades and decades, orchestrated this public hit to traumatize the nation, to facilitate this war in Vietnam, to addict as many soldiers as possible to heroin, modeling what they did and what they saw work in the 1860s with the assassination of Lincoln and the removal of a generation of young men crippled and wounded by the Civil War. Because right after that, you see the ascendancy of corporate power through a number of legal rulings that gave corporations the rights of people and the real blossoming of the impact of all the skull and bones people who'd been graduated and brought up into positions of power from 1832 by the 1860s and 70s, they really effected a revolution in our economics and finances by 1913, by 1916, and by the 1920s, so they could do what they want now with the economy, the great evidence that the stock market crash of 29 and the Great Depression, as predicted by many thoughtful people, just uh, machinations to uh, bring more wealth up to the wealthy and exploit the rest of us as, as hard as possible. I don't think I strayed from your question, did I? Did I? I'm literally, I've, I've lost track. <laughs> no, that's close enough for government workers uh, <laughs> in the military time. <laughs> Thanks very much, Bruce. Thank you. Um, Ron, I think you, you sort of implicitly answered Ron's question about uh, the mob um, story of uh, JFK's election. So we'll, we'll skip that for now. Ron, if you have a question, uh, a new question, feel free to pop it in. Um, Doug, Doug Moyle has been waiting for a bit. Doug Moyle, are you still there? And if so, you are on mute. I'm not actually seeing Doug here on the list anymore. Maybe he fell off. Okay. All right. So let's keep it on. Nathan, Nathan Carnier, are you still on? There you are. Yeah, I'm unmuted just now. Um, thank you, Bruce, for just a wonderful um, present speech. And I really take to heart what you're talking about. What can I, what, what, what can I do, you know? And I think that uh, in reference to his parenting, I think his father definitely, like you were suggesting, definitely imprinted or conveyed to him the, the notion of giving back and, and, and doing something, um, taking action in his life for the good. Uh, I, I really didn't, I really didn't wanna, um, divert the conversation too much because at the time I just had this thought about um, well how he was uh, there there are a lot of parallels to uh, to assassinations like with Abraham Lincoln with even with Julius Caesar you you have assassinations of uh, and I was just wondering what kind of role the Catholic Church um, played in um, in in the whole, in his election and in, in, in the healing process, 
after he was assassinated. And also, I just wanted to give a shout out to Matthew Eric because I just love the article about um, Russia and the with the uh, the history of the uh, a railroad between Russia and Alaska and the possibilities the future and extension of the Silk Road in that way is just fair. Oh, that really warms my heart. Okay, thanks. I don't, I'm not knowledgeable about the Catholic Church uh, in Kennedy's time and thereafter, as you've asked, but I have recently been talking with and working on a project or two with Paul Fitzgerald and Elizabeth Gould, husband and wife co-authors of many books, recently The Valediction in two parts. The Valediction.net is where you can learn all about it. Paul is a Fitzgerald of the branch from the Kennedy's mother, Rose Fitzgerald, and his deep research they have unearthed what looks like, certainly evidence, that the case could be made that Kennedy was killed as a Catholic by forces that consider themselves um, the descendants of the Knights Templar, and that there's some aspect of Kennedy's assassination being revenge and retribution for the 12th or 13th century eradication of the Knights Templars. And maybe, and maybe Casey knows something about this or not, the how the OSS or the CIA, jokingly or literally behind closed doors, consider themselves the descendants of the Knights Templars from the viewpoint of the United States being a Masonic project, not necessarily an evil one, but certainly a, you know, a non-Catholic, if not an anti-Catholic one. And I'm saying these things without any certainty, but just uh, conversations I've had and things I've read in the last year that open up that whole analysis. It might be far too much speculation. There might not be a lot of meat on those bones of that kind of evidence, but Paul and Liz have tons of it and anecdotes and other uh, conversations they've had with, with historians and descendants of certain families that flesh that out. And that's just, wow, it's just, it's endless. And that's the thing about the Kennedy assassination is if it gets into you, it's just endless. Kiss your life goodbye. You're going to be fascinated and follow some rabbit holes until uh, the day you whatever. Yeah, I would just say one thing on that point, too. I, I'm, I'm about midway through Paul and Liz's volume two of Valediction myself. And I, I, I'm friends with them and I've spoken with them for a while on this topic. And I got to say that they're, it's worth the read. Um, there's a lot of leads. And I, I only recently, about 20 years ago, I was, I was really obsessed with, um, I spent a couple of years really just obsessing in a very, very hard-headed way on Freemasonic, you know, um, material, deep history stuff. But I didn't really have the foundation to, to tackle it um, and make sense of a lot of the misinformation. There's a lot of loopy, soft-minded, um, mushy stuff contaminating the, the analysis realm of Freemasonry, right? A lot of conjectural stuff. Um, so I found I, I had to do other things and really like broaden and, and, and deepen my, my foundation on, uh, on a variety of other topics that would then allow me to sort of maybe revisit it with with a fresh set of of eyeballs um which i've only felt comfortable doing more seriously recently in in and this largely was was inspired by by cynthia and her work on the crusades uh that that play a big role in her uh her new book on uh, the the empire in which the black sun never set where she really zeroed it in on the uh the importance and grand strategy of the the crusades the, the first the third the second the third especially the fourth in 12 uh 1204 wherein europe was really turned inside out and um it was a major pivot of universal history and within that insanity that saw the destruction of this ecumenical spirit of collaboration between the muslim the christian world of charlemagne harun al-rashid the Chinese Tang dynasty that had reawoken the Silk Road back in like the 7, 680 period. So there was this whole spirit of cooperation development that saw three different societies going through Renaissance periods at the same time around the 8th to 9th centuries. The Khazarias, the, the, the Jewish Khazarian kingdom as well, played a very 
actually positive role in that entire development. All of that was destroyed um, with the Crusades. And uh, and the, the Knights Templar appear to have been, along with the knight, the, the, the Knights Hospitali Hospitallers, Hospitalier, co-created as two synthetic cults that retweet some, you know, um, Manichaean, dualistic, Gnostic um, doctrines that were dominant in another form within the Roman Empire. They sort of retweet them. If anybody wants to get a sense of what these are, look at how Augustine uh, trashes, correctly so, um, the Manichaean cults and a lot of the other synthetic cults that were masquerading as Christian. So that this these these cults were were part of a process to facilitate the constant new normal of Christian killing Muslims in the the Holy Land, but also Christians killing Christians, as, as we saw with Constantinople, the Christian city getting destroyed by Christians from the West, all being used as tools by these overlords, these grand strategists. So the, the Templars being cooked up that that emerged and was was morphed later on into the Rosicrucian Rosicrucian secret societies, Freema Freemasons in 1717. All the stuff is very interesting. And the fact that they have a memory that they, you know, these 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 oligarchs or the, these wannabe gods of Olympus do hold things in their memory that um, are not normal <laughs> and they hold a grudge. They still haven't forgiven Americans for what they did in 1776. Um, and I, I don't think that, yeah, that there's, there's a lot of grudges that they've held against the Catholic, um, the better Catholics, because you have obviously, you know, there's two Americas, there's two Russias, there's two Chinas, there's a clash of two Catholic <laughs> churches within, uh, within Rome. And JFK was, was definitely with, with Charles de Gaulle, with Enrico Mattei, um, another great Italian anti-imperialist Catholic. A lot of Catholics were the, the. The, the 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 on the front lines in the 1960s against the Malthusian ethic that was trying to take over society and uh, many of these were martyred people who really stood up to the devil and fought but then you had this other thing inside the church too so again um yeah there there's something to it I I don't subscribe to everything that 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 Paul and Liz have put forth as a theory of, of you know the last thousand years but there's a lot of value in there I wouldn't I wouldn't throw out the babies with the bathwater in my mind so that's that's my thoughts. There was a Ron, uh, Ron had a, a follow up question. Um, and then there Dallas professor has been waiting for a bit, too. So, Ron, you want to ask your uh, your question? You're muted. Oh, yeah, you're, you're muted, muted, Ron. Thanks. To what extent, if at all, did JFK consult with Eisenhower about strategies to contain the military industrial complex? Great question. I know he consulted with him at least about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Those tapes have been released. Those are fascinating to listen to. I know that he spoke to Eisenhower quickly after the Bay of Pigs fiasco. I would love, see again, I need another clone in another year of my life just to study that question, Ron. Um, I would love to. Casey, and any any response to Ron? Uh, yeah, I do, but you know, uh, oh golly, uh, you know Eisenhower went when when Kennedy and Eisenhower first got together. Uh, I think his uh, the Eisenhower faction felt that Kennedy was like a high school a high school senior, and I think that's how they treated him to begin with, uh, because here's this this old time five-star general who's been through all these wars and all, all through hell. And then you have this young kid coming up, a, uh, a junior Navy Lieutenant uh, who's a nobody, but he is a somebody. And uh, the, the good and bad part about that is, is that I think the, the Eisenhower uh, administration agency, whatever you want to call it, the people around him base and the people who were around him were the, uh, councils on foreign relations they were the they were the uh the institutes of uh of uh, your top lawyers and your elite lawyers and bankers and they were kind of focusing in on on what was going on at that particular time and and a lot of them did not want kennedy in there they actually wanted uh, nixon in there to carry over from eisenhower but as at, you know i think when when kennedy started to ask questions about what's going on and how to control the military 
uh, I think it was completely out of the hands of Eisenhower by that time. And I think that's part of what he was saying. He says, beware of the military industrial complex, because it's not just the military. It's, it's the bankers, it's the lawyers, and it's not just the United States. <laughs> and that's, that's what took me a long time to really comprehend. And uh, I, I think a little bit through your book, I, that kind of opened up another uh, avenue for me to travel. And, and Bruce, I got to tell you, you are absolutely correct. If you open up avenues in the Kennedy assassination, you will be there for at least 60 years because that's where I've been and I have not been off of it since. But all of these questions that people are asking, they're very, very good questions. And, 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 and when you're getting into the, the idea of the Catholic Church, holy cow, I, I, guess, that's, I guess that's appropriate in, in this terminology. Uh, the, the idea that, uh, uh, I, and I can remember probably 30 years ago in Washington, D.C., I picked up a pamphlet that said, Mother, uh, the Mother Church, uh, of, of Jesus Christ, the Roman Roman Catholic Church had uh, uh, had uh, reason to kill JFK, and I looked at that and I threw the thing down, took it, brought it home, and then years later I opened it up and started reading it, and I'm and now it makes <laughs> it actually makes some sense because it's tied to the idea of world conquest, new world order if you want to go in that direction, because I think that's where Alan Dulles and that's where that's where uh, Stevenson and that's where uh, Donovan were going at the end of World War Two. And uh, that that opens up a whole new aspect of who's in control and who's in charge. But it would, it would be great to know what Kennedy may have asked retired President Ike Eisenhower. Thank you, Casey. Matt, you said that Dallas professor whom I know as John Kleizek, uh had a question. I did indeed. Yes, John. Thank you. Uh, great presentation, Bruce. Uh, real quick question. Not sure if you can answer it. Uh, just popped up in my mind. Uh, when I was at Chris Milligan's house and spent some time over there, uh, he had a bunch of books on uh, little old literature on this killing of the king ritual. And I think he published, somebody authored a book on the, the Kennedy assassination as uh as an iteration of that killing of the king ritual i might be getting it mixed up in my mind with sk bain's piece on uh 9 11 kind of takes a similar analysis on it but i was just wondering if if you uh if you could explicate anything regarding uh that theory about the killing of the king ritual regarding kennedy yeah i've heard, and i've talked to chris at length about um kennedy's assassination being an example of that and also i've i've heard Paul and Liz and others talk about this probably British, maybe other cultures, but certainly British going back centuries, how the motif, it's not just, it's not just legend. It's, it's, it's chartable how the Royals designate someone willingly or not either to, well, it goes back to maybe like the 1200s where I think the legend of Rufus, it may be, Someone's got to look this up or back this up. Yeah, but William, yeah, William Rufus. Yeah, yeah. And the and the the speculation or the the literature that talks about how the king has to die. He does it willingly. The king is dead. Long live the king. And he's either killed by his replacement or he knows at some point I'm going to be sacrificed. And it goes back to the practices of having to water the ground every spring, maybe, or every seven years, I think it was. It goes back to those ancient things we did as people and societies and cultures closer to to nature. Um, And yeah, I've heard that discussed in in, uh, about the Kennedy assassination. There's a book Chris has in development about uh, Princess Diana, the assassination of Princess Diana and how it's another it's just another blood sacrifice by the royals of England over the centuries. We got to watch them very carefully, these folks, um, to say the least. But he's not alluding just, Bruce, uh, he's not alluding to the idea that Princess Diana or JFK were somehow willingly self-sacrificing in some sort of a blood ritual, right? That's not what he's alluding to. No, no. Okay. Not at all. Not at all. Okay. Okay. All right. right. Well, yeah. And I'm... 
Yeah, I mean, th this stuff, like you you guys pointed out, there, there's all sorts of numerological occult symbolism in all of these situations. And you could, you got to kind of be a bit careful to know when to say, okay, I, I understand the the principle of cause causation adequately to continue on my life and piece what I know as part of a broader tapestry. Because I've seen people who have wasted their lives obsessing over, you know, infinite, infinite, uh, details and lose sight increasingly of the whole that the detail is but a part of so you always have to be a little bit careful to walk both worlds of appreciating the details appreciating some of the the occult material but not getting lost in it too because that could also be a, a death spiral of purgatory um <laughs> in its own right Indeed. but yeah but but there's one more thing about this killing of the king aspect mm -hmm. a major part of chris milligan's appreciation of the assassination is its psychological warfare impact on the nation mm -hmm. killing the president is killing our father figure so children who see their father murdered in broad daylight in such a sudden and spectacular spectacular horribly spectacular way the effect that it has on us to then whoosh, lock into the authority figures who come rushing in i'll protect you i'll find out who did it they're there this is what's what happened and now follow me into into the future it really uh, can't be uh, overestimated i think right no, that's a very good point as you hear from those who were alive at the time and the impact in their lives thereafter this just it was the formative thing in their lives as 9 11 is for a new generation as the uh illness has been for the last three years and my, uh, I think it's worth pointing out, we have to ever be ready for these unbelievable horrors because to traumatize us is a major tactic of controlling us, freezing us, infantilizing us, terrifying us, and, and uh, making us succumb to just an insecurity about life and its powers if, you know, suddenly these horrible things. And you just see them over and over and over again of all the horrible plans they could conduct that they could do just criminally just for the sake of money they could do it without these public spectacular terror events wars calamities catastrophes every 20 years you know a president until the 80s and we almost lost reagan right there and a skull and bones vice president would have become president but we didn't so you know that's just one uh brought in just to mention mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it can't be treated as just trivia that you that you learn about this. There's definitely a, a subjective psychological um, aspect to shock therapy, which emerged out of the studies on MK Ultra on how do you deconstruct, depattern an individual? How about a group? Okay, can we extend that to a nation? How about humanity? Yeah. What type of things can you do? And and this was was people think oh MK Ultra was disbanded. And it's like no, not yet. maybe in that form it was maybe in the in the seventies, but it really just was normalized um, in many other ways and applied on a on a broader open scale. And I refer back to, to Cynthia's lecture that I had in my presentation. Mm -hmm. um, explores this how the degradation of our minds, our values, our aesthetics, and our love life. I think is to just get us into this fight and flight this protection mode you know which even at a cellular level biology has talked about when you're not in growth mode because you feel safe if you feel threatened you're in this frozen mode where you're not act, acting at full capacity you're not as intelligent as you are when you feel safe it's it's a huge huge factor in society the, the mind control the mk ultra tactics you alluded to i see it in the culture i see it in the entertainment you see it in the mm -hmm. advertising it's it's un once you see it you can't not see it yeah. And there's an author named Jay Dyer who's got a couple books out called Esoteric Hollywood, and his website is Jay's Analysis, and it's all along along these lines. And the, the wonderful thing is that there's a lot of folks out there passionate about the truth and getting it out there in every way they can. Mm -hmm. Well said. Well, we're rounding out the uh, the second hour. I'll uh, ask the, if there, if anybody has a question that they've been holding inside that they've been afraid to speak up speak aloud now is the time it's my your last chance to ask bruce a question so i'm going to give people a few seconds here to take this opportunity i oh, see Matt, mouth 
Oh. Matt, this is Casey. I'm just going to say something before I've got to get off. But thank okay. you very much for getting me on here, Matt. And thank you, Bruce. Uh, excellent presentation. And yes, I would like to speak with you guys later again. My, my problem, as Bruce knows, uh, I work 10 hours a day, uh, five days a week. And the time that you guys have had these presentations, uh, I've, I, I haven't had the opportunity, but I've always wanted to get on. So again, super job, super effort. A lot of this stuff needs to be talked about and continue with this. So excellent effort, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming, Casey. Thank you, Casey. So I have a question. I don't know if you can hear me. Yep. Okay, so and, and I'll just, because we're running out of time, I'll just jump into a comment that I believe Dick Cheney made 20 years ago, that we are in the process of making history. And you guys will be writing about this, but we are actually doing it. So, this analysis, this type of analysis going into the past and uh, trying to find inspiration from icons like JFK and so on. We have moved to a situation where things have escalated far beyond just an assassination of one person or a small fraud that might have occurred in the 1960 election. We're moving to a stage where the entire po populations have been locked down in their homes for massive amounts of time, kept away from their jobs. Now they're moving to impose censorship on even social media so that talks like this might get banned in the future. Uh, I've already faced reprisals on Facebook and Twitter for mentioning where the deaths and injuries have simply been suppressed, even though they are a formal you know, a database of the CDC, one of the regulatory agencies. Elections uh, are openly being stolen. I, I'm a lot more, uh, I, I believe a lot more the allegations that the 2020 election was stolen, all kinds of tricks, voting machines, dumping or disenfranchising of thousands of votes, uh, mysteriously votes appearing at the last minute and then being mixed with the counted votes and that the results change. Harinder, do you have a question you yes, can the question is into? this. Yes, the question is this. So the way I understood it, the point of your presentation was to give a pep talk. Use the uh, uh, um, inspiration of JFK, put your life on the line and do what you can. But what we can do is at every stage being, uh, uh, controls being put on us are, are intensifying at a scale that is that has never been done before. That's my question. So. How relevant then it becomes to, you know, to consider all, all the past in detail when what's happening at the present is is so much more uh, diabolical than it was 50, 60 years ago. That that's my point. And what I, I can't even I, 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 I be, the the time is coming when we won't even be able to post an opinion anywhere. I couldn't get a single letter questioning the COVID narrative published in, in a major newspaper. Doctors are being stripped of licenses. The level of dictatorship is now so brazen. Uh, we are at the stage where we must put our lives on the line or else we lose society. That's what I meant. Yeah, I, uh, you know, we're tied to the tracks. A train is coming. Let's chew the ropes. And let's nudge as many other people who are facing the wrong direction to see the train coming so they can start chewing the ropes too. But that ability also is being targeted by the coming, coming intensifying censorship on social media. Yeah, Harinder, I, I think what you really want to do though is reevaluate everything that Bruce just said because he's trying to intervene on the thing that is stopping us from and that has been self-sabotaging us this whole time, which is this question of our own identities. So it's not just a pep talk. There's really a, a way of thinking, not just feeling like feeling good. It's not about that. That will make it impossible for the oligarchy to, to thrive. And we've wasted a lot of time. We should have been chewing away at these ropes and, and making sure that we were never even tied to the tracks to begin with. But here we are. OK, it's unfair. But now we've got some teeth. We got an ability to get off. And you don't want people going fight or flight because if you just want bodies getting out there in going into action mode without having capacity built their wisdom, they will become weaponized tools of idiocy, like mob, mob, you know, how mobs are, are controlled yes. to create yes. chaos. That'll, that'll happen. 
And if you get people who are just in informed about how bad it is, but are so emotionally broken that they can't move, that's also bad. So you want to be able to really tap into this loving um, joy of life that Kennedy tapped into and knowing that you're up against something really, really dark. Just like, and it, it was evil wasn't less evil back when Kennedy was fighting it as it is today. It's taken on a different character. There's more people. They have some technological advances to work with, but it's it's just as evil today as it was then. Um, and I'm saying it's much worse today. That's my point. Well, no, you, you know, it is. But it's it's worse and better at the same time because you didn't have. And I'll just I'll let Bruce. I know Bruce has a thought too, and and so does Jerry. But but you also didn't have a multitude of civilizational forces back in JFK's life who are all saying no to the depopulation dark age agenda. Whereas today there is this convergence of a whole like network of international um, statesmen who are all representing different, different civ civilizational forces that don't want to accommodate some giant new big kill, which is really a big gift. Like that's something that's pissing off the oligarchy, probably even maybe more than JFK pissed off the oligarchy. So that's something to keep in mind too, is as a, as a point of hope as well. But I'll just leave it to Bruce. I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, you, you, those, that's you know, um, it comes down to, and forgive me, Harinda, because this is the kind of thing I imagine you could tell your kids and your grandkids, because you look old enough and you certainly sound wise enough. It comes down to knowing to a certainty what do you want, and that's the first thing I said about JFK. What did he do? He loved life and freedom. And that's a personal decision in the face of all the horrors you very well described. I don't care. I still want to enjoy every second, every minute of my life of being alive. That's my choice. I get to control that. And so do you, even, even though, even though the noose is tightening, even though they might take this from us and they might prevent us from doing that, even, everything you said is true. I don't care. I'm going to fight like hell to enjoy and love life anyway that's what i yell wanted to yell at you sorry <laughs> amen and uh, yeah the, the, i'm sorry to strike a dissonant note but that's it i won't that's thank you for responding yeah thank you jerry did you have a, a quick thought uh, before we we close it out today oh yes i'd love to if we have time oh thank you very much bruce that was a wonderful presentation i really enjoyed that and I, I just had a quick question because, you know, your portrayal of Kennedy as this lover of life and freedom, it's, it, it's an optimistic outlook. And I just see, I look at it from the cultural standpoint, and I, I wanted to know if you have looked at it too, that with the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination, in in a large way, we went from a culture that had that same optimism he had, and we became one of more pessimism. And you see it, you know, the way they brought in the counterculture, which is a real pessimistic outlook on life. But I wanted to know if you, you know, have, have looked at that change too from the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination. Yeah, I have. And I have to force myself to plug into any mainstream product, news or entertainment. I avoid it like the plague. I might be still relaxing from having turned in my manuscript two years ago after 14 years of intense study. And now I still get feeds. I'm on newsless. I get fed from many many sources so i know what's going on not to the minutiae that i did to master my material for my book but i it's so toxic the mainstream and the culture and what is society is so upsetting that i'm spending the vast majority of my time just trying to be very very present and loving life the way that i imagine reality and existence loves me. It gets back to what Matt alluded to a moment ago. And Matt, I'm going to be very brief about this. It's what's my philosophical, what's my metaphysical idea along the lines of a spiritual imagination, like I mentioned in my, in my lecture. And that's what gives me power. 
think thoughts that give give you power and it's corroborated by conversations with with people like this group and all the literature ralph waldo emerson rumi khalil gibran the upanishads the bhagavad Gita, marianne williamson deepak chopra wayne dyer anywhere i can get it anyone who's preaching and teaching quantum physics nasim haramain there is only one doing everything to ourself i can't fear another because in a way there really is no other and what i think and feel is my gift and it's my interchange with the universe and it is completely optimistic corroborated by those near-death experiencers and bruce talked for another six hours yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think that, that that is very important. We all are in a in a world of that is hyper materialistic, and there's a lot of emphasis upon treating our bodies well, exercising, eating right. But often people don't put the proper uh, weight upon feeding your soul well, feeding things that edify and empower your soul, which uh, is, I would say, a lot more, more, even more important. As good as as true and important as your body's health is, your soul's health is even more important, and it works very closely with your mind, your mind health, and together they work best when they're <laughs> when they're collaborating. So, Bruce, for that, thank you very much for this soul, soulful workout. Thank you. Very much appreciate that. I think everybody here shares this uh, this very positive feeling of edification. And going forward, we have a lot in the new year, a lot of stuff to work on, and. Um, Next present next week we begin a new symposium of about eight weeks of presentations on the role of art, painting, literature, poetry, drama, as far as tools to educate a citizenry um, and bring the those passions in alignment with reason and duty. So that'll be a, a fun exposition begun by Cynthia with an investigation into Lessing's Nathan the Vise, um, which is a really wonderful intervention in in. 18th century geopolitics in ways that you that might might impress and surprise so with that thank you everybody for taking the sunday thank you bruce for sharing your wisdom thank you very much thank bye you. guys thank you